So, uh, and many thanks for your hospitality. As Michael said, we had a wonderful day yesterday. So, I'm going to be talking about the etiology of gestational trophoblastic disease, and genetics, and um, some pathology as well. So, apologies in advance to any pathologists in the room, because I am not a pathologist. And I think there will be some overlap with the previous talk. But this is the outline of the talks. I'll be talking about classification of gestational trophoblastic disease, um, touch on incidents and risk factors, genetics, pathology, and then we'll talk about the specific types of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, um, choriocarcinoma, and then the atypical forms, placental site and um, epithelioid, and um, talk about gestational versus non-gestational tumours and why that's prognostically important. So gestational, oh. gestational trophoblastic disease is a spectrum of pregnancy-related disorders in which there's abnormal proliferation of the trophoblast. There are pre-malignant forms, uh, so complete mole and partial mole, and then the malignant forms, so invasive mole, gestational choriocarcinoma, placental site trophoblastic tumour, and epithelioid trophoblastic tumour. There are also tumour-like conditions, so exaggerated placental site reaction, placental site nodule, and more recently recognised that there is something called an atypical placental site nodule, which we understand has a small risk of transformation to a placental site trophoblastic tumour. Overall cure rates for gestational trophoblastic disease should approximate approximately 98%, uh, whereas 60 years ago, women would have sadly died from the malignant forms of this disease. And this is largely due to imp improvements in treatment and follow-up protocols, and also um, centralization of care, the development of um, effective chemotherapy, regimens and the use of HCG as a biomarker. So the spectrum of disease can also be seen on this slide. So on the left, you've got the pre-malignant um, conditions of complete mole and partial hydatiform mole, which can transform into gestational trophoblastic neoplasia with the risk of transformation being higher uh, with a complete mole but, um, than a partial mole. There's also the invasive mole and gestational choriocarcinoma and placental site trophoblastic and epithelial trophoblastic forms, which are the malignant forms of the disease. And the frequency of these is more difficult uh, to ascertain as um, gestational choriocarcinoma and placental site trophoblastic tumour can arise from any previous pregnancy event and not just previous mole. So there is a worldwide variation in the incidence of hydatiform mole, varying from uh, 66 to 100, 120 uh, cases per 100,000 pregnancies in Europe and North America, and much higher incidence is seen in the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. The geographical pattern uh, is similar for gestational um, choriocarcinoma, with again in Europe and North America, the ratio is thought to be between two and seven per 100,000 pregnancies, and much higher instances again in the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. The extent to which uh, these figures can be contributed to methodological <laughs> difficulties in obtaining accurate data is uh, unclear. There may be a difference in prevalence, but there's also discrepancies between hospital and population-based um, um, statistics. Um, differences in histological classification and lack of centralised pathology. So in the UK, we're fortunate to have a national register. So since 1973, all patients with a molar pregnancy are registered uh, with one of three screening centres. So the incidence uh, of complete mole in the UK is thought to be one in a thousand pregnancies with a risk of uh, transformation to gestational trophoblastic neoplasia in about 15%. The incidence of partial mole is slightly higher at three in a thousand pregnancies, but it has a much lower risk of malignant transformation, which is thought to be less than 1%. Choriocarcinoma is thought to be about one in 50,000 pregnancies, and uh, the more uh, rare forms, uh, placental site trophoblastic tumour, is thought to be less than half a percent of all gestational trophoblastic disease. 
So complete moles normally present in early pregnancy with vaginal bleeding. The previously uh, reported symptoms of um, uh, high, um, the previous reported symptoms of anemia, uterine enlargement, uh, hyperthyroidism, and preeclampsia are rarely reported now. And that's because the use of ultrasound is used much earlier, so these patients are diagnosed in the first trimester rather than in the late second trimester. Hydatiform mole is a trophoblastic lesion characterized by um, vacuolar swelling of the chorionic villi and trophoblastic proliferation. Uh, and it's then classified as partial mole or complete mole based on histological classification and carrier type. Ultrasound can be suggestive, but it's certainly not diagnostic. In a, a complete mole, you may see heterogeneous mass within the uterine cavity which is not associated with fetal parts, and you may see thecolutine cysts, although these aren't uh, seen in the first trimester. Partial mole tends to grow more slowly and presents later in the first trimester or in the early, early second trimester, but it's likely to also present with vaginal bleeding or an incomplete miscarriage. So what are the risk factors for gestational trophoblastic disease? Well, the two uh, over and above most um, well-described risk factors are maternal age and a previous history of mole. There are other risk factors reported in the literature, such as parity, parental blood groups, oral contraceptive use, and environmental lifestyle factors. But the data here really is wholly inconclusive, and that's why I've left all these in brackets. This uh, paper from Charing Cross looked at 9,500 um, moles that were registered over a 10 year period at the Charing Cross Centre. And you can see that the majority of cases, so 88% of cases, uh, were in patients between the age of 18 and 40, with about 4.5% presenting in younger teenagers and 2.8% presenting in women over the age of 45. Maternal age is a well-established risk factor, and this again shows the fact that uh, there is uh, a increasing risk of complete of, of molar pregnancy above the increasing age range. However, this is really for complete mole. There's a very modest increase in the incidence of partial mole across the increasing age range. And you can see for complete mole, the increased risk is uh, the, the, the increased risk for patients at the age of 13 to 18 is higher than for patients uh, 18 to 40. But then you can see as you get uh, to 40, there is a significant increase in the risk. So the percentage is 0.75 for a patient who's 45, and this rapidly rises to about 16% for patients over the age of 50. So this is a, a really nice paper that was published by the Charing Cross Group, um, and this looked at uh, patients who were registered with Charing Cross over a, tw over a 20 year period. They looked at 16,000 cases and looked at their um, uh, subsequent pregnancies as well. And this showed that once you've had a complete mole, the risk of developing a second mole was about one in 100. And this was usually associated with a complete mole. Once you've had two moles, the risk of developing a third mole is about 25%. And this is almost always associated with this being a complete mole. Following a partial mole, there is only a very small increase of a, an increase of a second mole. No real increase in the risk of a complete mole, but the risk of a second partial mole is about twice that of the general population of the UK. This paper also showed that approximately one in 640 women registered had this condition called familial recurrent hydatiform mole, which I'll come to later. But this is in, important, and we should really be thinking about genotyping molar tissue in women that have had three or more complete moles. And this is because they may have this um, condition, and if they want to consider a future pregnancy, they will have to have IVF with embryo donation to be able to achieve a uh, successful pregnancy, as they will not be able to do that um, alone. The, the top cartoon here shows the uh, um, normal um, conception. 
And you can see on the bottom row here shows the genetic makeup of a partial mole. So a partial mole happens when an apparently normal ovum is fertilized by two sperm. So these conceptions are triploid and have two sets of uh, chromosomes from the dad. So they're different to complete moles, which are diploid conceptions. So this usually happens when a ovum without any maternal chromosomes is fertilized by a, a single sperm, which then duplicates its DNA. And in 20% of cases, this might be due to dispermic fertilization rather than a single sperm. So complete moles are diploid conceptions. They have two sets of paternal chromosomes and no contribution from the maternal um, DNA at all. I've talked before about this syndrome called familial recurrent hydatiform mole. So these increase the risk of having a complete mole. But the complete moles in these cases are uh, diploid, but they're not all generated from paternal contribution. And these are in fact biparental. So they have one paternal and one maternal set of chromosomes. And this is thought to be due to autosomal recessive mutations on two chromosomes. So the more common one is NLRP7 on chromosome 19, which is thought to account for about 80% of cases. And then KHDC3L is about 5% of cases on chromosome 6. And as I've mentioned before, it's important that if we have uh, a, a patient with three complete moles, it's important to consider this as it will have a direct effect on um, her choices in terms of trying to have a future pregnancy. So, gestational trophoblastic disease arises from the placenta. So let's revisit our uh, trophoblastic physiology. So trophoblasts can be divided into three populations, cytotrophoblast, syncytiotrophoblast, and intermediate trophoblast. So Early in, early in gestation, cytotrophoblasts on the surface of the coronic villi differentiate into, into two pathways, a villus pathway and an extra villus pathway. On the surface of the villi, cytotrophoblasts differentiate into syncytiotrophoblasts, which have no proliferative activity. The second site of trophoblastic a uh, uh, second site of cyto, um, cytotrophoblastic differentiation occurs in the placental bed where the ovum's invading into the myometrium. And then the cytotrophoblast here differentiates into intermediate trophoblasts, which then infiltrates decidua, myometrium, and the arteries of the implantation site, establishing fetal maternal circulation. So hydatiform mole and choriocarcinoma arrive from villus trophoblast, whereas the more atypical forms like placental site trophoblastic tumour and epithelial trophoblastic tumour arise from the extra villus interstitial or intermediate trophoblast. In terms of pathology, a, a complete mole may look like this. So the macroscopic features depends on the gestational age. Uh, you may see in a large uterus, as we can see here on the right, film with this great light mass, and the great light vesicles of the swollen chorionic villi, with no fetus present. In terms of his, uh, histology, this lists the classical features of a, a complete mole. So you get large edematous chorionic villi with central cystin formation, as can be seen on the top right. And then you get diffuse circumferential trophoblastic um, hyperplasia. And one of the hallmarks is something called karyotic stromal debris. There aren't any vessels in a complete mole by, by this stage, but there are marked atypia of the extravillus intermediate trophoblast and then uh, at the same site, uh, an exaggerated implantation proliferation. As already mentioned, that complete moles may present early in the first trimester, and this can make diagnosis much more tricky because the histological features can be more subtle. So generally, the coronary villi can be smaller and cauliflower-shaped, and there may not be cystins present. 
rather than the marked circumferential trophoblastic hyperplasia, you may see more focal to diffuse hyperplasia. You might, you might get this confused with a partial mole. You may, you're likely to see stromal mucin, nuclear debris, and at this stage, stromal vessels may be present again. You might be thinking this could be a partial mole. So there are clearly diagnostic pitfalls here, and again, sampling problems can worsen this. There may be necrotic or subnormal chorionic villi, and this may be a very small sample. And sometimes if there's no villi and you're seeing trophoblastic hyperplasia, you might be thinking of a choriocarcinoma. In terms of macroscopic appearance of a partial mole, there commonly may be no, evi may be no macroscopic evidence of molar tissue. You might see just cord and membranes with norm normal appearing villi. But on histology, there are two discrete populations of villi with swollen and large villi and more small sclerotic ones. And you get this pro prominent scalloping, which can be seen on the left-hand side there. And you get this circumferential or focal mild trophoblastic hyperplasia, which is very different to the hyperplasia you would see in a complete mole. Uh, you'd also see trophoblastic inc inclusions and blood vessels are present. So again, this can sometimes make the difference this between this and a complete mole harder to see. So this slide uh, nicely summarizes the histological and chromosomal differences between a complete mole and a partial mole. But there, if you're still not sure, other ancillary techniques can be used to help you make the diagnosis. And there's something called P57, which I'll talk about shortly. And the reason why it's important to get the correct diagnosis is because this directly affects patient care and follow-up. So we know that the risk of transformation from a complete mole is about 15%. So in the UK, we have a, a follow-up protocol where if the HCG normalizes within 56 days, we then stop the follow-up at six months post the evacuation. Whereas if the HCG uh, it takes more than 56 days to normalize. We would stop six months after uh, the HCG is normalized, so a slightly longer period of follow-up. We've recently shortened the follow-up for partial moles, so actually we now stop much earlier, and we stop after two normal samples. So this, own, this directly affects the patient because it obviously um, uh, helps them uh, be able to you know, try for a further pregnancy if, if they wish to. So a distinction of a molar pregnancy, including the subtype, partial mole versus complete mole, is clearly very important. But also we need to be able to distinguish between non-molar pregnancy and molar pregnancy, because this will also affect follow-up. And this shows the importance of expert pathological review. So we know that uh, on review of first trimester non-molar hydropic abortions and complete moles. They're often labeled locally by, par by, by pathologists as partial moles. And that's because use of ultrasound is, is making the diagnosis of, of um, evacuation of complete moles much earlier. So the, the um, vacuole appearance of the villi might not yet be complete. There might be still blood vessels present. So uh, people thinking they're partial moles. And also we know that chromosomal abnormalities can also closely mimic partial moles. And this was a nice article that showed that when an expert pathologist looked at slides where a partial mole was diagnosed, they only actually confirmed that diagnosis, that diagnosis in 50% of cases. So we need further tests to help us here. And um, ancillary tests include things like um, P57 immunohistochemistry, ploidy analysis. So P57 immunohistochemistry is important. And this comes from the principle that a small number of genes are what we call imprinted. So they're only expressed by the maternal copy or the paternal copy of, of the gene. So therefore, any gene expressed by the maternal chromosome will not be expressed in complete moles. So P57 is expressed by the maternal allele and can be visualized on histology by brown nuclear staining in the cytotrophoblast and villus mesenchyme of um, all um, uh, conceptions apart from complete androgenetic mole. And this can be seen on the left-hand uh, panel there. You can see that the cytotrophoblast in a complete mole is staining negative. 
Now, you get an internal positive control with this, because P57 isn't imprinted in extra villous trophoblast, so that's a nice example of an internal positive control. And you can see on the right-hand panel there, the cytotrophoblast is clearly staining positive. So that shows you that this is a partial mole. Uh, P57 would also be positive in normal placenta and in hydropic um, abortions. Ploidy analysis by flow cytometry and FISH can also um, be helpful in terms of separating between a diploid and a triploid conception, but it does not distinguish between a, a complete mole and a diploid non-molar miscarriage or a molar versus a non-molar triploidy in which um, molecular investigations would be required. And this was a paper published by the Sheffield pathologists just showing the importance sometimes of using ploidy analysis and P57 and um, in the um, refinement of a local diagnosis to a central diagnosis. So other ancillary techniques, and Michael mentioned this before, and this is called fluorescent microsatellite genotyping. So this is looking at the genetic diagnosis of trophoblastic tumours. So i.e. which parent does the DNA in the placental tissue come from. So this is looking at uh, analysis of short tandem repeat sequences of DNA. So on the right hand side there you can see the technique for this and I'd like to thank Rosemary Fisher for, for these slides. So you can see that representative samples um, from the placental villi and maternal tissue are extracted, the DNA is prepared and then it's amplified up using PCR. And you can see on the, on the left-hand column there, you've got the maternal DNA at the top and then the placental villi on, on the bottom. So you can see that both in the maternal DNA and the placental villi showing the same allele, but there's also a paternal allele. So this shows, because it's diploid, this is a non-molar pregnancy. On the right is a triploid conception, and you can see that in the placental villi there is maternal DNA and also two paternal alleles, showing this is a partial mole. So moving on to choriocarcinoma, which is a very uh, aggressive HCG producing epithelial um, cancer, which we think uh, the incidence is approximately one in 50,000 pregnancies. It tends to present with vaginal bleeding and marked elevation of HCG and often presents with the complication of metastatic disease such as large volume lung mets or brain metastases. Macroscopically, it looks like that in the top right hand panel. There may be single or multiple masses and you see these hemorrhagic nodules with central necrosis. On histology, the, the, the key appearance is a biphasic architecture of syncytio and cytotrophoblastic proliferation and the absence of chorionic villi. There's marked atypia, these are very mitotic tumours and they uh, show signs of venous invasion. As Michael's already alluded to, we do know that there are non-gestational HCG producing tumours and sometimes in the clinical setting it may it may put you off that this could be a gestational tumour if there's been a long interval from the recognised pregnancy or an unusual site of um, metastases. So it's important that we don't just assume that something is non-gestational because that could affect the patient's prognosis and they could be significantly undertreated. So it's important that we are able to assess whether um, trophoblastic tumours are gestational because they're very much curable by chemotherapy and treatment is tailored using a prognostic scoring system and, and treatment uh, tailored to treatment response. We've also heard about ovarian germ cells that produce HCG. Again, can be curable with chemotherapy, but they need different chemotherapy regimens. They're often combined treatment with surgery and chemotherapy and treatment duration is dictated by stage rather than response to treatment. And then we have the third group, which are non-gestational, poorly differentiated carcinomas that uh, unfortunately, uh, when they present with metastatic disease, tend to do badly. So patients often would show a response to chemotherapy, but then they would often progress. So generally they're not curable uh, and shouldn't be treated as aggressively. 
So the, the take-home message from this slide really is that we should consider genetic testing in trophoblastic tumors, tumors if there is metastatic disease from an unknown primary, if there's been a long interval from the previous recognized pregnancy, or there's uh, a um, uterine tumor with abnormal uh, or unusual pathology. So if we try to genetically look at trophoblastic tumors, obviously if it's gestational, using the same techniques as before, if it's gestational, the genome will reflect that of the pregnancy in which it arose, so you'll see paternal DNA, whereas if it's non-gestational, the genome will just reflect that from the patient. And this can be shown nicely in this slide, and again, thanks to Rosemary for these slides. So in, in the left-hand panel, you can see in the middle there is the um, representative DNA from the tumour, and the patient DNA is, is at the top. But you can also see the tumour DNA includes alleles from, that aren't from the mother. Um, so this on the left is a gestational tumour. Conversely, on the right, the tumour DNA there looks pretty much like the patient's DNA with no um, foreign DNA there. So this is a non-gestational tumour. So these techniques can be really helpful in making this distinction. We've touched on tumours of the non-villous trophoblast. So these are the very rare placental site trophoblastic tumours and the epithelial trophoblastic tumours. They are rare, they're thought to be one in 100,000 of all pregnancies and probably less than 2% of all gestational trophoblastic disease, uh, less, sorry, less than 1% of all trophoblastic disease, certainly in the UK. Uh, we don't know as much about them. They were first described as a separate entity in 1976 and they were recognised as a malignant um, diagnosis in 1981, which was biologically unique from choriocarcinoma. So they may develop after any form of pregnancy, but more likely after a norm, normal term pregnancy. And these can occur months to years after the index pregnancy. And we'll hear more about these later from Michael. But most of them present with abnormal vaginal bleeding. They tend to have more localized disease. They're slow growing, less vascular, and they don't commonly produce much HCG. Um, and the key prognostic factor here is the time from the antecedent pregnancy to the presentation with uh, four years seem seeming to be the cutoff, but we'll hear more about that later. Microscopically, it looks, uh, the, the cells look rounded, polygonal, uh, large intermediate trophoblasts. There's an absence of chorionic villi, um, more scattered mitoses with a low key 67. And there is generally infiltration of the myometrial my fibers um, and very infiltrative borders. So this is my understanding on why the uterine uh, sparing surgery in this diagnosis is very difficult, because it's very difficult to get clear margins. The differential diagnosis of a placental site tumor includes these, and sometimes they can look like squamous carcinomas. So, in summary, maternal age, previous mole, ethnicity and geographical region are risk factors for gestational trophoblastic disease. Partial moles are triploid, two sets of paternal chromosomes. Most complete moles are diploid and androgenetic, apart from in the familial recurrent uh, um, high datiform mole syndrome. They are still diploid, but they're biparental. It's really important we get the correct diagnosis because it, it um, looks at risk of malignant change and how we follow the patients up. Hopefully highlighted the importance of central pathological review. And we sometimes need ancillary techniques to help us take that forward. It's rare. The most common frank malignancy is choriocarcinoma, uh, which is eminently curable with multi-agent chemotherapy. Tumors with trophoblastic morphology and HCG production must be uh, that may be non-gestational, and we've talked about reason, uh, why that's important. And uh, we'll hear more about the atypical forms later of PSTT and ETT, but the time from the uh, antecedent pregnancy to the diagnosis is the most important factor. I'd like to thank uh, all these people listed on here, uh, including um, the great teamwork we have with the London Centre. So thank you very much.